from Matthew verse Matthew Matthew chapter 5 verse 7 Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. For the, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's this uh, man in Chicago left to go to vacation in Florida. He gets to Florida and checks in at the motel. And there at the motel, he's going to send an email to his wife, who's on a business trip, and she's going to join him the next afternoon. Now, when uh, he sends the email, he uses the ho uh, hotel computer because he left his at home. Now, in his home computer, all he had to do was type in his wife's name, and it automatically put the email address in. So he had to, in this case, try to remember his wife's email address. Well, he didn't. He typed in a number, which was part of her email address, and it was the wrong number. So the email went to another lady. The lady who received his email was a lady who had just buried her husband that morning. And they had just had supper, and after supper, uh, she decides to check her email. She hadn't seen it in over a week. So as she checks the email, all of a sudden, when she comes to his, she screams and shouts and faints. The family in the other room hears it, and they come running in. And they see her on the floor, and they look at the computer screen, and it reads, Honey, I arrived this afternoon, and uh, I'm preparing the room for your arrival tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> Blessings, your loving husband. P.S. It's awfully hot down here. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, there are some things about our faith that we can laugh at, but this really is a serious matter about heaven and hell. And Lord... This scripture points to that issue. Lord, I pray you help us understand this issue, not just understand it with knowledge. Help us to live it out. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, there's a word I want you to learn, and you can say it with me. The word is splagnifica. Say it with me. Splagnifica. One more time. Splagnifica. Say it with enthusiasm. Splagnifica. That's right. We're into it. Splagnifica is the uh, Greek word for mercy. Now, one thing that is confident, consistent throughout the scripture is that God is a merciful God. In Exodus 25, you see uh, God give the instructions for building the Ark of the Covenant, which was a big box, and inside the box were the Ten Commandments, and inside that with it were Aaron's rod and a container of food from the wilderness when they were in their journeys. On top of the, this ark was where God sat. And the two, two cherubim images were to the side of God. And the place where God sat was called the mercy seat. And it is listed seven times in these four or five verses. God, mercy, trumps over legalism. God's mercy trumps over the law. And all the way through the scripture, it says very clearly, let's just take, for instance, Exodus 34 at the point in which the second set of Ten Commandment tablets are being built. It says very clearly, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Jump over to Lamentations of all books. Chapter 3, verse 22, the steadfast love of God never ceases. God's mercy never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. Well, if God is gracious and mercy and loving and forgiving, why does it seem to be such vengefulness of God? It's not that God's not graceful and merciful. It's that people don't receive it. And thus they get their just reward. Well, now, that is an issue of heaven and hell. How's that? Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew 18, you have, beginning with verse 23, Jesus telling a three-chapter parable. The first chapter of the parable, God said, I mean, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like a king who wishes to settle accounts with all his servants. And one of the servants says, uh-oh, I'm caught. 
I owe $200 million. There's no way I can pay it back. I'm in trouble. My only hope is to fall on my face. And he does. Fall on the floor in front of the king and says, Lord, have mercy upon me. And what does the king do in front of everyone? He, he grants mercy. Now, do you catch a nuance there? Do you catch a meaning there that most people don't see? The nuance is, who's going to pay that $200 million if he's not going to pay it back? The Lord does. In every parable, the king or the main character is always God. It does begin with the kingdom of God is like a king who wishes to settle accounts. The king is God. Is there anyone in this room who can pay back what we owe to God right now in our lives? Is there anyone who can pay it back? Raise your hand. No one. We owe God far too much. How's God? God pays it back. How? Well, part of it is through Jesus' death on the cross. He paid the penalty of what we owe to God. He died on our behalf. What kind of grace is that? That's grace. That's mercy. Now, that's chapter 1. Chapter 2, this guy who had just received the mercy from the king is going home or some other place, and he comes across a guy who owes him 20 bucks. And he says, hey, you owe me 20 bucks. You're going to go to jail unless you pay me right now. This guy, who's another servant, does exactly what the first guy did to the king. He falls on the ground, face down, and cries out the very same word, have mercy upon me. What does this guy do? He says, no way. You owe me 20 bucks. You're going to go to jail until you pay it. Now, how's he going to pay it back while he's in jail? He can't work for it while he's in jail. He can't pay it back. Well, do you catch the nuance there? The nuance of chapter 2 of this parable is, as scholars say, there are a lot of us who want to be receiving mercy from God, but we don't care to show mercy to somebody else. We want God's mercy. We want to get off the hook. We don't want to hurt. We don't want the pain. But we want to get back at that person. We want to say what we want to say to that person. We want to chew them out. We want to make sure they hurt. We want to make sure they suffer. Anyone like that? You don't have to raise your hand. Most of us are like that. And that leads us to chapter 3. Chapter 3 of the parable says that the king found out and he brought this first servant back to him and said, wait a minute, I forgave you a $200 million and you can't forgive him with 20 bucks? Hey, I'm going to throw you into jail because you just didn't learn. And you're going to be tortured there until you pay it back. Now, he's already said he can't pay it back. He'd never be able to pay it back. And if he's in jail, he's not going to be able to earn it. So that means for all eternity. And then Jesus ends this parable with an epilogue. In verse 35, he says, So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Wow. Um, let's go back to this beatitude. What are the beatitudes? Good attitudes to be in. This beatitude says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Doesn't say, blessed are you when you receive mercy, then you'll be merciful. It says, blessed are the merciful, then you'll receive mercy. It's a two-letter word that I struggle with. We prayed it this morning in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive those, us of our sins. Forgive us of our wrongs. Forgive us of everything that we need to be forgiven of as we, that's what Jesus taught us. It's the only part of grace that has any kind of condition to it. Jesus put it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. The judgment you give will be the judgment you get. The judgment you give will be the judgment you get. If you're merciful, you receive mercy. Why? We're created in the image of God. God is a merciful God. 
In the image of God, we are to be merciful. Now, how do we become merciful? What does it look like? First of all, it's the element of forgiveness. No ifs, ands, and buts. It's the element of forgiveness. Um, this is Black History Month. And one of my heroes of the Civil Rights Movement was a seven, first grader named Ruby Bridges. Remember the story of Ruby Bridges? She was the first African-American child to go into an all-white school in New Orleans. And as she's going to the school, she's surrounded by federal agents who are protecting her. And the, the, the videos from that showed all these white and Ku Klux Klan people yelling, screaming at her, yelling obscenities. She holds her head high, walks straight through the crowd without fear. She gets to the steps of the school. She walks up on the steps. She turns around, looks at the people, and says something. But no one can hear it because they're too noisy. And she turns and walks into the school. Later, a counselor asked, what did you say? And she said, oh, I just said what I think Jesus would have said. Father, forgive them because they don't know what they do. And you know, those of us who were racist during that time didn't know what we were doing. Most of us have been converted, but some of us still have some racism in us. We still don't know what we're doing. Forgiveness is a key element of mercy. Anyone here not want forgiveness? As we want forgiveness, we need to forgive. Now, that brings us to the second part of mercy. Mercy is more than just say, I forgive you, let's move on. No, mercy is much more. It goes back to that word splagnifica. The Greek word splagnifica means more than just forgiveness. It means from the womb. It comes from the word from the womb. Mothers, when you had your child in your womb, your body gave everything that child needed. Every nutrient, every source of oxygen, every source of protection and antibodies, your body did everything it could when that child was in the womb to make sure that child grows in to be a human being that it's meant to be. The word splagnifica literally means the womb from the bowels of God. God does more than forgive. God puts us into a situation where God wants to nurture us, give us everything we need to be totally and completely healed. And God wants us to do that with another person. Now, it doesn't mean that if you and your spouse divorce that you're going to all of a sudden get back and married again. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that your best friend who betrayed you or your enemies who are your enemies are going to become best friends. It doesn't mean that if you've been in a working environment that's just painful that you're going to really enjoy going back to work. It doesn't mean that at all. It means you're going to get healing. You will receive the healing, the complete healing that's needed. It doesn't mean you don't show tough love because sometimes the most merciful thing you can do is to show tough love. But it means that the healing will take place. Uh, in South Africa is a great classic historical example of that. Apartheid was the legal term used in South Africa which meant segregation. And for the longest term, that was the law. Blacks and white were never to get together. As apartheid was coming to an end, there was an issue that had to be resolved. And that issue is, there were those who were the prosecutors, those the persecutors, who were intentionally hurting people who were the other race. And then you, they wanted to say, well, you know, apartheid's over, let's let bygones be bygones. Then there were those who were hurt, who said, no, we need justice, they need to be punished. It was the church, led by Peter Story, who was our Methodist bishop there at that time, who was Nelson Mandela's personal um, chaplain in jail, prison, and Desmond Tutu and the other religious leaders who led the nation to come to the Truth and Justice Commission. What was the Truth and Justice Commission? Everyone who committed pain on another had to confess to that person or to the group, and if the person was dead, to the nation, and it was televised, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. They had to say every single thing. And if you told the truth, 
everything, held nothing back, and you really meant it, then nothing you said could ever be used against you in the court of law. But if you hold anything back, if you don't tell the truth, and that's discovered, that could be used against you to get justice. They believed healing would come through the truth. And it did. Much of the nation received healing. It was an example, historical example of mercy. Just as one example that several of you know about, just as one example, there was a, a policeman, and this is televised nationwide, every one of them, who tells to the person across, on such such date, I came to your village, I went to your hut, I took your husband, took him to another place, tortured him, burned him to ashes. Then a year later to the date, I went back to your village, went to your hut, took your son, took him to that same place, tortured him the same way, burned him to ashes, just like I did before. And he tells far graphic, far more than what I just said. Described much more detail. Well then, she had a chance to respond. She says, I want three things. The first thing I want is I want you to take me to that place where my husband and my son died. And I want to take a shovel and I want to dig up the dirt that's there because some of my husband and son's ashes are probably still there. And I want to take them and give my husband and my son a proper burial. Second thing is I don't have a husband and son anymore. So I want you to come to my hut once a month for a day where I can be a mother. And I want to feed you. I want to give you gifts. I want to talk with you. I want to be a mother to you. And the third thing is I can tell you hurt that this has been on your conscience for a long time. And she said, I want to get up right now. And she said, I need these men to help me because I'm feeble. And I want to walk over to you and I want to give you a hug. And I want to say to you, I forgive you. And they did. They helped her up, walked her over to where he was standing at that point. And it was so overwhelming for him that he fainted. There's power in that because the nation saw it. The nation saw the power that can come from healing and forgiveness. Mercy. Mercy. How do we get it? Well, let's go back to the verse. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Starts with the word blessed. Remember the Hebrew word again? Bend at the knee, you bow down before God. Lord, I need your mercy. You don't demand it. You don't say, I deserve it or earn it. It's a gift from God that we don't deserve. Lord, have mercy. But Lord, please help me. Surrender my anger towards this other person, my resentment, my want to get back. Help me surrender it all to you. And that leads us to the second word, the Latin word for blessed. Anointing. Let God anoint for healing of your anger towards that person. Let God anoint it. And watch the healing that takes place. And the third is the Greek word, which means it's all-encompassing. That's all we need to do. As simple as that. Now, there's one place a lot of us need healing, and that's within our own families. Um, classic example of that is a seven-year-old boy who later, as an adult, tells what happened when he was seven years old. He was sitting in the back seat of his car. His mom comes to a traffic light, and she uh, at the stops, and she turns and looks at him and says, I wish you were dead. I wish you weren't alive. I only had you because I didn't want my husband to leave me. He left me anyway. I wish you didn't exist. Well, he relived that moment day after day after day all the way through school. And the way she treated him was the same, as if he was resented. 
Later in life, he's talking with his mom, and he said, I've come to realize, Mom, that if I were in your shoes, I may have felt the same way because I look like Dad, you tell me. And I have many of the manners, and so my presence reminds you of him. It reminds you of that you were a high school girl, and you got your high school education, but you didn't have a job, and you had to support me. And so here, my presence reminded you of him, who turned his back on you, reminds you of your failure. So I understand that, Mom. I understand we were both victims of circumstances that we did not choose. And I forgive you, Mom. Healing took place. One of the places we need healing most is within our own families. And when we take a step back, most of us realize we're victims of circumstances within our own families that really weren't of our own choosing or we chose incorrectly. Whatever the circumstances, we need mercy there. And the amazing thing is, so counterintuitive, if we are merciful instead of getting back at someone, not only are we stronger, it's a fact. People who are merciful have 40% greater immunity compared to those who are not merciful. They have 55%. It goes down. 55%. We become stronger, healthier people if we're merciful. So where do we begin? At the feet of God. I need your mercy. But Lord, I also need your mercy to forgive somebody else and to be merciful with them. Will you pray with me? Lord, we know what you've taught all these years. This is nothing new. Lord, we know what we need to do. Lord, it's not a lack of knowledge. We need your help. We need your conversion. We bow down before you, Lord. Anoint us to where we let go and are merciful. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen.